Uh, thank you, Peter, and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you here today and uh, in your busy lives, taking the time to come out. 45 years ago in Howick, often described, as we all know, as racist and where few Māori lived because it had been a fensible settlement at the time of the Anglo-Māori Wars, this town chose someone with a Māori background to be their MP. That was all the evidence that one needs to know that Halleck was not racist then, and it's not now. So it's great to be back in Halleck, and where this town gave a chance for a young New Zealander to start an early political career and a legal practice. <coughs> Nobody's perfect. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's fashionable for political parties to deliver a New Year State of the Nation address. Other parties, as you know, have already done so, which is surprising because any analysis of any value of the true state of our economy wasn't known until last week, the 15th of March, when the latest measurement of our economy was announced but they went ahead and said what they thought anyway. The alarming news is that New Zealand's GDP in the last measured quarter declined by 0.6%. That means our economy is not growing, but shrinking. And the stark fact sits alongside the worst balance of payments figures since 1989. And there are a number of people in this room who can't remember that because they weren't alive. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to say present company, but some facts that they got to, have got to remain. It means we are spending far more than we are earning. In short, the most dangerous outcome of our economy and country in 34 years. We're living beyond our means while we're going backwards. And it's time for contemplation. Never can one remember a time when things are failing everywhere, all at once, and people know things aren't working. So it's time to contemplate how exactly we got into this predicament and what we all need to do about it. New Zealand, as we all know, and it's not a political statement. It's honestly in a perilous economic state, but it didn't, it didn't just happen overnight. And we have reached an inflection point. It's now or never to get it right. What we decide to do together now will determine whether we go on declining or put things right again with policies of common sense and certainty to take us back to the top of the first world where we once were in the lifetime of so many people in this room this afternoon. You've seen us when we were at our best. There was a time in politics when politicians took the view that my party, when it's right, should be kept right, and when it's wrong, it should be put right. Today, there's an awful tribalism in New Zealand politics, ignoring realities, replacing them with politically extremist ideologies, where political party comes first and country a poor second. You've just seen a party change its leader, all planned late last year, forced upon you as being a surprise, because the tanks run out, we're told. <laughs> they picked her up. Well, can you imagine Helen Clark saying the tanks run out? <laughs> or, Peter Fraser, or Peter Fraser saying the tanks run out? No. But a mainstream media accepted it. 
when clearly it was designed and planned, and some of us said it last year. But then what would we know about politics? <laughs> it is amazing. There's an awful tribalism. In the living memory of people here, there have been successful Labour and national governments. Be honest, there have been. Re-elected election after election because those leaders put the people first and not their obsession with political power. And that is something we have got to do again. To that, today, sadly, too much that is Labour and national is just the same. We know it. Remember, there was a housing crisis under the last national government. It's worse today. There was an educational crisis under the last national government. It's worse today. There was a law and order crisis under the last national government. It's worse today. They were catching and warning. Today, it's a fishing policy, catch and release. <laughs> well, it'll be laughable, but it's so sad. But that's what Judith was doing, catch and warn. And now it's catch and release. And you're paying the price for it. There was a cost of living crisis under the national government. It's sadly worse today. And yet there are people campaigning for this election with one naked policy. And you've all heard it. It's our turn now. And I bet you're asking yourself this question. Your turn? To do exactly what? When and how? Surely you deserve to hear an answer to that statement. It's our turn now. Turn to do, turn now to do what? Well, I hope not. <laughs> this is about an inflection point in our history. We've been here before. A man said in 1893, New Zealand is God's own. And everybody forgot the second thing he said. He said, New Zealand's God's own, but the devil's own mess. And he set out to change it way back in 1893 by first giving women the vote. His name was Seddon. And we became a transformative government back then, and it was massive, the changes that were made. And then we saw in the 30s, late 30s and the 40s and the 50s, national, and Labour then national, actually taking us to the top of the world. We had been there before. We're not dreaming when we demand to go back there again. This election must be about the New Zealand people. Whatever our background, whatever our race, our religion or creed, for if we don't work together, if we continue these numerous divisions, there will be doomed, our people, a repeat of the same failures of the last few years. You see, the mass majority of New Zealanders are, and don't rush and complain about this statement, but it's about humanity. The mass majority of New Zealanders are conservatives with a sense of humanity. We believe in giving our neighbours a helping hand when that neighbour's in trouble. We want our hard-earned taxes spent on those issues which, as a mass majority, we believe in. Now, during Cyclone Gabriel, despite bureaucratic failure everywhere, we saw so many people working together to address the crisis right there, right now. They put aside their differences and focused instead on their shared humanity and shared gold, with many putting their lives at risk as well. And today's politicians must surely learn from that exercise and that example. Get out and talk to New Zealanders all over the country and hear their concerns. Listen to ordinary Kiwis alarmed at what is happening to New Zealand, our country. And stop listening to the PR merchants and the spin merchants and the puffery merchants who think it's all about the latest polls. You'll decide this in the next election. In those seconds in that polling booth, you better make sure you become the master again. Because guess what? Politicians might hate it, but you are. But don't waste the chance. Make sure your vote counts. Listen to ordinary New Zealanders, you know. 
We're proud of our distinctive identity and culture and the cities and towns and villages we live in. And we know that with the right management and working together, we can do the impossible. It was amazing at the last Women's Rugby World Cup when by good management, they put together a team of women players, Pacific Mara and European, even had male and female coaches and achieved the impossible. But they only got there by a proper analysis of how serious their crisis looked when they were facing that challenge. It was serious, but it wasn't hopeless. And they imaged cooperation, conciliation, inclusivity and teamwork. And over 90 minutes at Eden Park in November last year, they shocked the cynics and they moved their sport ahead decades, just 90 minutes. And that's what our country needs now. A proper analysis of how serious our cause looks. And today, today ladies and gentlemen, have a look at the daily headlines, if you can stomach them and if you can believe them. And whilst doing that, remember that politicians are not your masters, they are your servants. And scanning the headlines today, we are bedeviled by a number of truths, and they are truths. Our country is facing the highest cost of living crisis increases in the last 34 years. Inflation is continuing to climb, and we are facing a recession, and many countries are doing far better than New Zealand. All costs are going skyward. You know it. Food, rates, power, diesel, petrol, rents, mortgages, school fees, insurance, university fees, healthcare, all basic costs going skyward. And what's the response from Wellington? No inquiry into bank charges, benefiting foreign banks. Why not? They've had five inquiries in Canberra into their own banks, but none here into Aussie banks. What's wrong with this scene? No inquiry into supermarket costs? Why not? No inquiry into energy costs? No action from Wellington? Just more promises and more borrow and spend. And the real crunch is coming for you, the workers, you middle income earners and the seniors who now have so little, if any, disposable income. You know, governments have a record of particularly going after seniors. And that's exactly what every political party in Parliament is planning to do. If you don't believe me, Labour, Greens, National and Act all believe in increasing the retirement age. They clearly have not done enough physical work because for some people, 40 years in the physical jobs is just too much. They don't seem to understand that. Maybe they think that manual labour is the Prime Minister of Mexico. <laughs> well, it sounds like it. And why do I say that? I say it because over the history, many here remember it, there has been only one party that's always defended and fought for seniors. And we have never supported a change to the retirement age, or attacking your incomes, or your super, and that commitment has never changed. And under New Zealand First, the superannuation age will not change. Now tell them I'm not talking, I'm talking to you. <laughs> You remember the past? Numerous attacks. Labour first, then national, they all agreed. Only one party, when its leader was much younger, ever defended you. Because we believe that great societies have these features in particular. They look after their young and their old. That's what great democracies and great societies and great economies do. And we need to go on doing that in our future.
They'll be coming around to see you in the next few months and making you all sorts of promises. But the good book says, by their deeds you will know them. Don't forget. Look at the record. You know, in education, our country was once a world leader. Phenomenal, really, when you think about it. Way out in the South Pacific. Long way, 12,000 miles from its markets. Leading the world when it comes to education. We now see our literacy and numeracy rates continue to decline in core subjects. And a continued fall in student achievement over the past two decades. The past two decades. We have stopped focusing on reading, writing and arithmetic and now teach a range of sociological values to the alarm of so many parents. Parents who know that achievement at the start of a child's life, their child's life, in reading and maths, is essential for fulfilment in their later life, for academic success, for upward mobility, for economic success, and indeed in being able to participate in their society. And the failure in the past 20 years is not just the lowest decile schools, but it's now also in the highest decile schools. And what does that mean? Well, our system of education has been the victim of numerous virtue signaling tinkerers who have never been challenged. And they would now rather teach a young child virtuous self-identity theory, <laughs> whatever that might mean, than basic maths and English. Yeah. Our education system should be fundamentally focused on education, not using our children in some sort of woke social re-engineering program for vulnerable, underdeveloped minds. Yeah. And here's the point. And when were they allowed to decide that parents' views don't matter? When did they ever ask you? When did they ever think that you who are paying for all this needed to be consulted and asked as to what you thought? With truancy levels running, this is staggering. And people in this room know what the rules used to be like. With truancy levels running at over 60% in many schools. Not 5% or 10%, no, 60%. It's clear there is no plan to fully train our young human capital. Yeah. Some of us went to country Maori schools. You didn't turn up, you better have a notice the next day. You have to have an excuse. No more, where's Charlie? We don't care. No. We had to turn up. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, attending school has been compulsory since, get the deck, get the uh, century right, 1877. When a whole lot of people in Parliament without education thought it was critical to train people. So they said you must go to school. 146 years later, what does this government think taxpayers funded education is for? A child not at school is a child not learning. Preschools, primary, intermediate, secondary, tech institutions and universities, now all in serious trouble. Why it's important? Because it's our human capital and how they're trained will determine how good our economy will be into the future. You know, all of us have had to seek work. Well, ever since Adam went and ate that thing that Eve gave him, <laughs> we've had to work. Yet New Zealand's labour market is a mess today. In just a few years, this labour government has allowed 50,000 more New Zealanders to depend on the job, job seeker benefit. 50,000 more to depend on the job seeker benefit. This is a time when employers are screaming out for workers. The government then has just linked benefit increases to inflation. A virtual pay rise every year. Now, let me ask you, when was the last time you got a yearly inflation pay rise in your income or your salary? <coughs> the problem isn't the level of the benefit. It's the length of time spent on it 
and the lack of incentive to get off it. Yes, we need to give a hand up in people's time of need, but not create a handout that some choose as an easy, long-term lifestyle. Yeah. The fact is the Job Seeker Benefit list is now loaded with school leaders, school leavers with low levels of education and no work experience. This means, you know, we just aren't understanding how serious the long-term drain on us and our economy will be if we don't turn this around real fast. It means like Germany and Taiwan, we need to seriously help the young seeking apprenticeships and help the businesses who provide them, thereby providing more work opportunities in training, backed up by sanctions on those who can train and work but choose not to. Our country, as I said, was once in the first three in the world. It's probably why people used to get off a boat in the old days and the first thing they'd asked, be asked or plane in the 60s and 70s, the first thing they'd be asked is, what do you think of New Zealand? If it hadn't been here five minutes, they'd be asked, what do you think of New Zealand? It was quietly, we were proud of it. We knew that we were number one, virtually. For example, the Minister of Labour used to know every unemployed person by name on the register. <laughs> Not because he had an Alan Fantine memory, but because there were only 29. <laughs> Not 1,000 or 100, just 29. Don't tell me we can't do it again. Whether you trust the daily headlines or not, the picture in so many areas of our society is a bleak one. Take our health system. We are once again a proud world leader, but cracks are now emerging everywhere. Almost 70,000 New Zealanders have been waiting four months for treatment, or worse still, to get their first specialist appointment to have their condition examined. And every day the waiting list is expanding with fewer elective surgeries than before the arrival of COVID. People seeking orthopaedic care, for example, hip, knee replacements, shoulder surgery, amount to one in four patients waiting more than four months. How many times have you been told by politicians that we've addressed that? that we've fixed it. Emergency departments are under siege with big gaps in critical staff and for many patients, the choice is dismal. As one specialist said, the choice is between, quotes, who has the worst cancer and who won't survive until next week without intervention, in a quotes. Plenty of people are dying because they can't get timely treatment but would survive if they did. And just yesterday we learned that our immigration bureaucracy, despite spending millions, has only secured 19 visas for overseas nurses. That's about 400 million per nurse. All the while hundreds of Kiwi nurses, doctors and midwives have been unjustifiably and unconstitutionally mandated out of a job. And before some of those naysayers and liars get out there, I'm vaxxed three times. But I believe in the right of people to be told of its possible damage or consequences, and for people to have the right to decide themselves. Yeah. You know, we're gonna have 50,000 people shoulder to shoulder in a stadium but we still have desperately needed workers mandated out of their jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, how mindlessly arrogant are these people in Wellington destroying lives, workers' lives, in this way? Under New Zealand First, these mandates, which we believe are unconstitutional, will end. I know when it comes to operations, to deceive the public, the politicians have set the thresholds for treatment too high. So demand already at crisis point by these high thresholds is seriously understated. And it's all been done on purpose. You know how it goes? Well, if we haven't analysed their problem, we won't have to treat them, will we? If we haven't analysed their problem, we won't have to treat them, will we? Does that sound like a public health system to you? 
No, it's not. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a criticism of the hard-working doctors and nurses and medical staff. On the contrary, they deserve our full gratitude. And as we look at all the issues facing our country right here, right now, the crisis in health, you won't be seen in the polls, but the crisis in health is our biggest one. You can fix a lot of things up in time, but when people stand to die, if they don't get treatment, you cannot fix it up unless you get the treatment right here, right now. It is our biggest crisis. This crisis in health must be addressed in Budget 2023, starting with a name for the health service that 95% of New Zealanders can understand. <laughs> Not Te Fatu Ora. <laughs> Everybody knows that language and communication is about understanding, but these people don't care. We've got a waka kotai heading down the road. They're going to be out in the water. Get on Air New Zealand. They've got the waka in the sky. Why are we putting up with this bull dust? It's your country. Take it back. Yeah. Under New Zealand First, we will change all the woke virtue signalling names of every government department back to English. Back to what they were before the academics from university sociology departments started this madness a few years ago. And it's not an attack on the Māori language. I was there when the first funding for Māori language ever started in my political career and I'm proud of it. But it's an attack on the elite virtue signalers who have hijacked the language for their own socialist means. This conceited conniving cultural cabal doesn't represent hard-working, ordinary Māori. They only seek to use Māori to further their own agenda. Yes. And some Māori secretly driving this agenda are of the people, but they're not for the people. They're of the people, but they're not for the people. Do you see them going on about housing, education, Elevators for Māori, or health, or first world wages? Oh no, not that. That's what Māori need, and that's what the whole world needs. No, no, they're always obsessed with these things. They use their people. And in addition, under New Zealand First, we will meet St John's funding demands. We'll ensure Plunkett is funded to do their job properly. We will fund Mike King's Gumboot Friday charity. We won't be spending... <laughs> We won't, like Labour, spend $1.9 on mental health and end up with five beds. <laughs> Which is what they did. We'll ensure rescue helicopters and surf life saving New Zealand are properly funded. We'll ensure Farmac has more funds to get the medication to the people that need it most. But the first thing we are going to do is sort out Farmac itself. Yes. We're going to concentrate on performance, not puffery. That's what we should be investing in as a country. Not Auckland Harbour Bridge cycleways, 29 billion on Auckland light rail, and countless other cultural virtue signal madness. We say that the first responsibility of any New Zealand politician is the safety and security of New Zealanders in their homes and in their streets. You know, the last week the Labour Party appointed its fifth minister of police in three years. Fifth in three years. She began, the new minister, by saying, quotes, government must do better on retail crime and repeat offending. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and she was saying that to a glum looking former minister of police, Mr. Hipkins. <laughs> You've got to see the photograph. But in a moment of honesty, she admitted what we all know. Labour is soft on crime. Yeah. And it might sound dated, but the present crime stats are undeniable. Total crime is up 33%. Violent offending is up 42%. Sexual offending is up 16%. Theft offences up 49%. Ram raids, most committed by youth, were up last year 
by 465 per cent. She calls that retail crime. <laughs> See how you get away with it? Doesn't sound so bad when you say retail crime. Most of the people are saying, what would that possibly be? <laughs> it's an example of it. Why has Labor, and what has Labor done to law and order? We didn't secure, in 2017, 2,238 extra trained frontline police between that time, 17 to 20, 20, New Zealand First didn't secure all those new policemen and women for this outcome. And under New Zealand First, if you commit a crime and are part of a gang, it will be law that it is an um, automatic aggravating factor in your sentencing. In addition, if you assault a first responder, police officer, paramedic, firefighter or corrections officer, in the course of their duty, there will be an automatic six-month minimum mandatory prison sentence. Yes. We will no longer allow gangs to run amok on our streets like they are doing and have been allowed to do these past few years. And if you know anything about the Māori world, every time something like that appears because the propensity of gangs to be Māori appears on the six o'clock news, the people are ashamed of it and we need to do something about it. You know, Cyclone Gabriel showed just how dependent we are on electricity. Not just on cooperation, but on electricity. Today, our electricity is 55% hydro, 80% geothermal, 10% natural gas. Wind power provides 6%, and solar power is 1%. And Labor and the Greens have been using inferior imported coal from Indonesia to generate electricity as well. Ladies and gentlemen, some policies about energy and our future set against the facts of our supply chain above are simply alarming. You're hearing all sorts of rhetoric from politicians about their plans for future energy when we already have, if managed properly, the chance to create energy that is affordable, reliable and sustainable and at a lower cost to our households, businesses and to our economy. We've got the mix there already. In New Zealand, though, they don't seem to understand, in some of their comments, that it doesn't always rain. The sun doesn't always shine. And often there is no wind. So some suggestions from some politicians have no connection with the facts, past, present, or future, or the weather itself. They rule out natural gas when it's so important when water, sun, and wind are not present. And if inferior coal with higher carbon emissions from uh, the natural gas is the Labour Green answer, then they are in la-la land. Yes. New Zealand will need more energy to rebuild our economy and our lifestyles. That will require common sense planning and policies proven to have worked alongside necessary new investment. The last thing we will need though is politicians waving their hands around, claiming the sky has fallen in, whilst arguing for grandiose plans that will see us all go broke. Question. Would you rather the Greens go and spend 16 billion plus of your money on carbon credits, credits in offshore economies? Or would you rather you spend that 16 billion on your children, your schools, your hospitals and infrastructure that we need now? Ladies and gentlemen, that's a brief snapshot of where sadly New Zealand is in 2023. It means we have some real problems to address right here and right now. Problems so fundamental to our future that they can't be ignored beyond this year. And a lolly scrambled budget that ignores these critical issues will be just disastrous. Why do people who do the household budget know this? Down there with all those PR officers and advisors and lobbyists, they don't seem to understand the most rudimentary thing of home economics. <coughs> but having said all that, something more serious has emerged in political and public life that the mass majority of New Zealanders never asked for, don't want and don't need. What happened to one country, one people?
Some of us are Maori and Scottish. There's nobody perfect. <laughs> Get your, gives you a natural suntan and a desire to save money. <laughs> or as Billy T. James used to say, but he couldn't say it now, could he? The world is so woke. He said one half of you wants to get drunk and the other half doesn't want to pay for it. <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't got a sense of humour anymore, you're not allowed that either. <laughs> what happened to one country, one people? A new blight on our society is a serious diversion from what New Zealanders of all backgrounds, races and beliefs really need. An obsession of an elite few seeking to tear down the very fabric of our society. It concerns the insidious attempts to change this country's culture and institutions. In short, to remove from us the inheritance that our parents and our parents before them, in difficult times, left for us. It concerns political engineers who without any authority have nevertheless been given license to use your money, taxpayers' money, to indoctrinate the mass majority towards their perverse thinking. And their way of thinking is an all-out assault on Western values and on the very essence of our democracy. One person, one vote, and each vote being of equal value. There is a full-scale attack being waged on New Zealanders culture, identity and sense of belonging. And the only way they can achieve this is by attacking the bonds that used to hold our society together and to misrepresent the facts behind our shared history. This elite, self-appointed, self-opinionated, have as their purpose the destruction of our cultural inheritance. They want to totally overhaul our system of government and values by a political fait accompli, by releasing an army of Pandoras from their box of tricks on the simple basis. It's out now and you won't be able to put it back. That's what they're saying. Well, that depends what you think. It's out now, and you can't change it. Their paradigm claim is that New Zealand is institutionally racist, and therefore a retarded society. Why do so many people want to immigrate to this country if we're racist? See what I mean? But they say that we're institutionally racist, and therefore a retarded society. This is peak madness. Today, all they speak about is rights. They never speak about personal responsibility. Yeah. Never. Yeah. They're all into minority rights. Teaching children gender identity theory. And they're not interested in debate. Anyone who questions them is gaslit or culturally cancelled or just shouted down. Yeah. This gaslighting group is a small minority while the mass majority is meant to kowtow to them. And too many political representatives are not prepared or have the guts to stand up to them. This is a paradox in that the one of their claimed concerns is Māori. When one of the essentials of being Māori is conservatism with a capital C. It's extreme inverse racism because what they prospect, and I hope every Māori that's watching this program understands this, it's extreme inverse racism because what they prospect for those of us who have Māori in our background is the belief that we can't be equal without first getting a hand up from them. The only way we could be equal is they've got to help us. How racist is that? And it's also the emergence of a new class of society which shuns the company of, of working women and men for their self-concerned solutions for working people's lives. They've got a thousand solutions for workers but they never want to be part of them. Most of these people have spent their lives skulking around the fringes of academia and now wish to impose their ideologies on the hard-pressed men and women of our country. Notice how the rights of family or children or women have become their obsession? And the last people they want to consult are families 
women or you. Labour may now be furiously trying to put co-governance on the back burner, but they, and sadly too many, even in national, still believe in it. The tenets of co-government are based on a massive lie. They're saying that on the 5th of February 1840, when no one in the British Empire, or indeed Britain, was in partnership with the Queen, two days later on the 7th of February, Māori were. Right there is the lie. The simple fact is Māori ceded sovereignty to the Crown because for years before 1840, and many of us know well about it, they wanted law and order in their country. No matter how much the cultural Marxists want to try and rewrite history. And in arguing partnership they mean 50-50. Even though the mass majority who claim to be Māori and who claim to be speaking on behalf of all Māori are not even half Māori themselves. <laughs> By the 1975 Electoral Act, and there are some people who remember that act very well, by definition of a Māori, that's half Māori or more. By that definition, they don't even amount to 6% of New Zealand's population. So who are they really representing? And which part is the real challenge? Which part of their mixed DNA is going to compensate the other part? Why don't they tell us that? Which part of their mixed DNA is going to compensate the other part? Ladies and gentlemen, why can't they answer that question? You know, New Zealand is the beneficiary of Western values, democracy and rule of law. It's also the beneficiary, thinking of it, of the enormous cooperation that has happened between Māori and Europeans. Because the funny thing is, Māori were very acquisitive. They love to see new things. We always have been. Take some of them shopping. <laughs> I'm not looking at anybody here. <laughs> but look, we're the beneficiary of Western values, democracy and the rule of law. Of course there were things bad, but we're trying to take out the best part of it and readapt it and go forward to a greater society. And the advancement and enhancement of those principles have only occurred in those societies that have united together as one, one people, and to celebrate their nationhood instead of perpetuating division. With cooperation, conciliation, inclusivity and teamwork, our country can make it out of this crisis to a better future for every New Zealander. We can become again the envy of the world. This is the first of many meetings we'll be holding in campaign 2023. Remember, politicians are not meant to be your masters, they are meant to be your servants. Too much of this country is in a right mess. That's because the people who are suffering are not the ones who caused the mess. Our once great society was built on hard work and a fair go for everyone. Our once great society was built on hard work and a fair go for everyone because there were people practically in Parliament and their thinking believed that was important. Our once, uh, so our bold and bold steps are needed to lift our country back where it belongs. Countries that do well work as a team and everyone has a role and a part to play. So I sent out a message from Haag this afternoon that is unmistakable and uncompromising. That we are aware of the plans and purposes of others. That we know of their secret agenda. That together we can and will stop them. That we will rebuild our country for the many and not the few. We will reconstruct our economy for, the, for every New Zealander, not just a few over mighty subjects. Was it for you? How do you know? He didn't answer it. <laughs> we will reconstruct our economy for every New Zealander, not just for a few over mighty subjects. That's our vision, that's our commitment, and that is our commission to protect and save New Zealand to take our country back. Please join us. Thank you.
Peter's asked me to, will I take questions? And the answer is yes, I certainly will. If we can't answer them, I'll tell you because it's patently obvious. But please, could you make them a question? Because the shorter they are, the more people can ask questions. I have questions. Peter, I come to a time you have to choose who you will go with. How will you do that? If you have to go with this one, Peter. Because neither of them are going to get outdoor to actually govern us. So how will you do it? <laughs> For 30 years, that's all I've had at meetings. <laughs> you know something, we live in a democracy and my party's a democracy, it's serious to be in a democracy. Ask any of my colleagues whether we make unilateral decisions like that. We consult and we decide. But we've made it very clear we're not going with any party that practice racism, that seek to divide this country that argued for things like, hey, poor, poor, and a whole lot of things like that. We've made it very clear. Our pathway for Māori is to take their education, their housing, and their health, and make it first world. That's what we were lucky enough to have when we were young, and we want our children to have it in our future. When we've talked to others, then we'll decide, because it's not about forming a government. It's about asking great questions and forming a real good government. Kia ora, Great Honourable Sir Winston Peters, the senior event, sir. Um, Chief Forecaster Gareth Kernan says, we think the economy is already in recession at the moment. We suspect that the final quarter of 2022 will have shown negative growth. And we're expecting negative growth to pretty much continue throughout 2023 and early next year as well. My question, what can New Zealand First Party bring as a number one solution to this great deficit problem that is affecting all New Zealanders today? Look, that's an excellent question. And uh, when he said that, some of us were saying last year, this country is going to recession. Uh, you don't get any credit for saying it. They don't say, well, you said that. And there's nothing so antiseptic anyway as this, is the statement. There's nothing so sterile as the statement, I told you so. But we darn well did. What we've got to do is ensure that we spend all the money we've got, we possibly can, first of all, to keep people going, but then to rebuild our wealth, our exports, our um, self-reliance, when we could be using product in New Zealand rather than getting them offshore, do everything we possibly can on production and wealth creation, wealth creation and not consumption. Consumption is here today, gone tomorrow. Wealth creation sits there and will be there in 50 years' time. It's still working for us. And that's our terrible failure. We're a country, you know, where a man between 1870 and 1880, I don't want to be reciting history, but he built more railways in 10 years with horse and carts then for the next 130 years, we can do it. But you've got to have leadership that's focused there and not trying to buy people off with lolly scandals. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, my question is three parts, all related. Um, and I'm just wondering. Three questions. What's behind the. Three last waters. Thing? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> three questions or one question? It's all related, and I've asked this question to my elected MP. I live in Mount Albert. Surprise, surprise, I got gaslit. But anyway, um, I'm just wondering, what's behind the massive increase in police helicopter activity in the last couple of years since the last August lockdown? And is the negative impact on the mental health and quality of life that we're experiencing justified by the undisclosed benefits in terms of arrest and crime prevention? And finally, is there a surveillance agenda beyond the frontline policing that we're not aware of? This is deafening, and on some occasions, sometimes it's impossible to sleep with the constant air surveillance. Yeah, we've lost some answers. Well, the answer to more helicopters in the sky is they're chasing more crime. <laughs> now, I suspect in your question, you think they're on a spying mission. <laughs> Let me tell you, they haven't got the resources. Uh, and I'm 
that someone who, who has, has been, we're a party that went out and got uh, 2,238 extra police. Because you cannot run a business or you cannot be safe in your home, you can't live in your home unless you've got security. It's the number one priority in, in that, that sense. But as for things like surveillance and travelling all hours of the day and night, I look, I live in, in central Auckland. We're all the same. Um, I, I can't answer that question in the way that you counsel it. I'd love to, perhaps you drop me a line. I'll sit, I'll sit and go out and find the evidence that backs up what you're saying. I'd rather do that than be like some got the answer to everything. I'd rather do the inquiry. Yes, yes sir. I'm very concerned with what you mentioned before about separatism and the future of New Zealand. Phil, I was on your agenda. Uh, I, I totally agree with what you said. My, what I've tried to do is try to understand a little bit about the concern that was ripping us apart, I believe, uh, which stops the freedom. The point that I like to raise and see what we're going to do, I think that all the problems we had come from the Waitangi Tribunal. Uh, to my understanding, it was a tribunal that was put in place, was sought by Alan Clark and Matthew Rata. This is growing crazy right now, but it just makes decisions which are really off the hoof and are taken up by the narrow politicians. To try and educate myself a little bit, I looked through to find out what Mary thought about the policy and the treaty. I came across a, uh, an article by the right over Sir, Sir Alfred Nutt uh, about the treaty. I'm sure you see it. It's very clear, it's very concise. It's totally opposed to what my tiny tribunal's promoting. My question to you is what you said before about our future. From my point of view, the most serious thing we've got, GDP and everything else taken into consideration, is we're ripping ourselves apart. Until we stop that, we're not going to make get back to where we were when it was a great old country in the the world. Yeah. What's good for New Zealand is good for me. And so yeah. my question to you is really, for people like me, we want to understand the treaty, what the problem is. And from my point of view, I take the trouble of reading that. Anybody here should read that. It's very clear, it's concise, it totally opposes what's happening to the white Chinese tribunal. And somebody should ask the current Maori party, why they just believe this. This comes, this is written in 1922 by this gentleman who was highly revered. Uh, so look, I'm sorry, but it's question time. And I did say, okay. I did say, the link you take stops two or three other people asking their question. I don't, I'm not going to have. And you're right to quote that. But that was written by the greatest Maori politician in this country's history, who got a law degree in two years flat. Maybe he's smarter than Willie Jackson. <laughs> Maybe he's smarter than the modern Maori party. I know he is. And that's a very good treatise there that uh, Ngata wrote. And he writes it on the question of sovereignty and being seated as well. It's all in his works. I am a great admirer of Ngata, as my Scottish mother was. Because she thought he was an intellectual genius. He also had some great tips for Maori health and food. But here's your question. Why don't you see these people campaigning for Maori housing, education standards, uh, for uh, Maori health access, or first world wages? You never do. You don't see them stopping work for that? No, it's all about their pet projects. Or turn it on its head. If you know you can't do a darn thing for Maori in the real area because you've got no policy, then you focus on this sort of stuff. And they're on about it every day. Now, look, yeah, I'm trying to get to it. I'm trying to, I'm not asking the Maori party at all. Because they're pretenders, mate. They've been around for a long time, they're going nowhere. What about the Waitangi tribe? Well, the Waitangi tribe, well, no, stop. You're wrong. Helen Clark didn't set it up. It was set up in 1975 by Matt Rata and the then, uh, and the then uh, rolling government. However, it was from 75 onwards. And then, of course, the Longy Labour government took it back to the 6th of February 1840. The real point is, if you're going to kind of claim that the Treaty of Waitangi, you didn't cede sovereignty, what are you doing at the Waitangi Tribunal then? It's these anomalies that they need to be attacked on, and my party spends its time 
trawling through the information to take the, these shibboleths apart. It's hard work. But I've had a career in a long career where I stand. I've been at it for 45 years arguing this one thing. We are one country, one nation, whatever our background is. And the only chance of surviving is understanding that. And I, sir, believe that the mass majority think of Māori think the same. I'm out to stop the elites who are, as I said, of the Māori people, but they're not for the Māori people. Yeah. And they're getting wealthy, and they're getting wealthy on the misery, they're getting wealthy on the misery of their people's backs. I intend to stop it, and I've never stopped. Uh, uh, just, uh, just, but just in case, you know, you've forgotten. It was John Key that went off and signed the Indigenous... Uh, uh, John Key that let us down in 2008. No, 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 no. 2008, I was the Foreign Minister and I didn't sign up. I stopped Helen Clark signing it up. John Key got it and he signed up in 2010. We're running out of time. Let's begin. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 Son? Well, if, uh, sir, I'll answer the question if you can put it. I'll answer the question. I'll answer the question if you can put it with precision. Tell me what you're asking. Not a speech. Oh, well, when you told me that Helen Clark established, I, I got somewhat diverted because she didn't. And you've got to defend things when they're wrong. The reality is that Waitangi Tribunal is now making work for itself, and that's going to stop. Well, uh, sorry, sir, but if you'd asked me a shorter question, I might have got this faster. <laughs> <laughs> Winston. Yes. Yeah, over here. Over here, Winston, the other side. I'm oh, sorry. Most of us, if not all of us in this room, uh, probably believe that we have the worst government, socialist, arguably a new style of Marxism, uh, approaching government that we've ever had. Now, what... I'm going to ask you, as, and I believe you are either the elder state, statesman or one of the elder statesmen of New Zealand politics. If we had an election tomorrow, the polls tell us it will be a knife edge. Winston, that tells me that half of our country, our wonderful country, where I've been here for 52 years, one a wonderful country, half of the people are either morons or, or they or, or they are not properly educated, or they don't care, but they support this. Uh, no, look, uh, Please. One of the basic things I learned when I was at school was that a question is a question. <laughs> and I was talking about the basics at the start of the speech. Can you can ask you, a question? Can you advise us why it is you think that half the country still support this government? Uh, the answer for that is, uh, you'll recall very well, the media and a lot of our critics between 2017 and 2020, calling me and my party a handbrake. Yeah. All right, they did, we did so well that they took all the credit and they won the election all by themselves in 2020. We've only been gone two and a half little bit years and look what a disaster they are without experience and without a handbrake. Yeah. And don't blame those. Don't blame, don't blame the public. Don't call the public morons. They've been uh, fed a fodder from the mainstream media that is not true. Yeah. Why? Because the mainstream media took a bribe of 56 million off the government. Yeah. Don't, don't, we, they wouldn't do it when I was there because I stopped it. I don't know, since they got them by themselves, way they go, brought the media out. So don't blame the New Zealand people. And my answer to you in the end is this. If we do not turn this around, it'll be your and my fault, right? We're gonna have hundreds of meetings like this we intend to go out there and change this country because it's a cause that is desperately needed to be fought. Madam, madam, I know, madam, 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 I just told them that's not the way to treat people. <laughs> I agree with you. The, 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 reality, no, the reality is they have not been given the information. And frequently, you know, the number one, the one, number one ability in politics is, if you're any good, you've got to learn to ask good questions and don't stop asking them. 
but it's not happening. But then if you've been bought off, what do you do? And bought off they have been. But I'm told I'm meant to be smiling and look after the mainstream media in the next six months. It's going to be very difficult. Uh, one more question, maybe? Yep. Yeah. I'm here. Hi. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Just know this lady, lady at the back waving as well, sir. I would like to talk about a child justice. Children today who are looking in their shops and liberating are 40 and 15 year old. If you don't deal with them today, in 10 years' time, they will be uneducated, unqualified, hard criminals. So what would you do to deal with that today? Because today is the time when you can put them in the boarding school and force them to educate themselves because if they are little of the night stealing, this is mean they don't go to school. So you have to do something now, not in 10 years' time, because today you have to build boarding schools. In 10 years, you will be building prisons. Madam, uh, madam you're reading my speech back to me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll add one more thing. When they commit these offences and they go before the court, we're taking the parents along as well. I know. You say don't? No, yes, we will. We are helping parents, we're paying benefits, everything else. I want to see who's allowing this child to do that. I want a total family solution. Not from the sociology department of York University, but from plain common sense. Um, I was just trying to figure out what this is a question, but I think our recently left Prime Minister, who wanted to um, I don't think she said oh, there's nothing more on the tank. I believe she actually said there's nothing more on the bank. <laughs> Winston, one more for the uh, can I just say, uh, one of those statements, the second one is true. <laughs> the first one is an excuse. Yes, madam. you say that and um, one, of the, one of the sad things that a lot of parents will know that often a child in development is at a tipping point the right treatment now and you get a better outcome the yep. wrong treatment and sometimes it's, it's a matter of fortune what might happen you're quite right we'll never we're not going to bring back compulsory military training but I think that young people should be given options we're going to take you away but put a lot of investment into you to try and get you right. And the army is fascinating because the army has done such an unbelievable job for Maori people. They go in the army and they turn their lives around dramatically. And years ago, a famous the head of the military in our country, General Pornanga, asked the former Prime Minister, Rob Muldoon, he said, Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister asked him rather, Prime Minister asked the head of the military, how many Maori have you got in your army? And you know what Pornanga said to him? We have, Prime Minister, just soldiers in our army. You see the difference in the thinking? We've got to get back and think like that. But if you're talking about programs to try and turn recidivist lives around, I think it's worth the investment. The other day, a guy got caught for committing fraud in the Westland local government. He, I think he stole 77,000 and he got a whole lot of years in, in prison. He shouldn't be going to prison, he should be out there working for the community. He's, he's not a danger to society, and that's $130,000 going to waste on him every year. No, there's some people should be in prison who are a danger to society, and other ones should be out working, doing something. One more question. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to know your opinion on our friend We have one of the largest diasporas in the world to Australia, and they're constantly marketing our, for our nurses and our construction workers to move to Australia to much better conditions. I'm curious, 
whether or not you would ever consider changing the agreement to stop Corkish Australian Company from taking our work from us. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Uh, in 1976, the Prime Minister of New Zealand was asked what he's going to do about this problem of uh, New Zealanders going to Australia, and he said, well, it's going to raise the IQ in both countries. <laughs> you remember that? No, you don't. But he said that, and sadly, it sounded funny, but it's not. The reality is, people would not believe in this country if we had comparative wages with Australia. The second thing is people all forget. But it's 1984 and Roger Douglas with a man called, uh, um, 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 uh, sorry, not Roger Douglas, uh, David Longy and Roger Douglas started government in New Zealand at the same time as Bob Hawke and Keating were starting government in Australia. Two new governments. Hawke and Keating went down an incremental path of improvement of their economy, and we had a political revolution of neoliberalism in this country. And over the next 25 years, Australia grew in real terms 34% bigger than us. That's why our people are going to Australia, because your political leaders here have failed. Let's get it fixed. <laughs> Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'm from Australia and I saw you. You're in New Zealand, but I am in Australia. And I saw you on the Carl Staten Avenue morning show saying, My country needs me. And uh, what I've heard today from you, I completely agree with that statement. But are you intending next time you go on this program to set out what you said today to stop exactly the same co-government problem that's happened in this country, happening in Australia, because that's what the Labour government is doing with the, with the voice for the Aboriginal. You know something, uh, just the other day, the wording on the referendum was decided in Australia. You read that? Yes, I did. The amazing thing about it, and I, one should be interfering with another country's politics, but I'd ask one question of Australia. Do you honestly think that the Aboriginals have one voice? Do you honestly think that? That they would have one voice? It's like going down to the South Island in Night Tower and saying, you think like Nani Pro, don't you? Or worse still, you think like Ngāpui, don't you? <laughs> they don't get it. And here's the tragedy, because when you go down that pathway, there'll be an elite who can do very well out of it, sucking on the, the state of the taxpayers' money, whilst the mass majority will have their concerns and needs utterly neglected. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry to finish that brief, um, rather gloomy note, but thank you for coming out this afternoon. As I say, It's not, it's not part of my speech. It's not part of my speech, but I have great affection for this place. As I said, I had a law practice here once, and if things were going so well, I did more and, and made more money in one month than I made for the next year in politics. <laughs> and everybody thinks I'm mad for going back into it. But in the end, this country's worth fighting for, and I hope you yep. agree. Thank you very much, Winston. But I have a request, and it's an emotional one. Please, ladies.